it's always for me a great honour coming to talk to you folks uh, because what I do know is that if I ever needed first aid I'm in safer hands with yourselves than I am with the average doctor that I work with um, and that may come as a shock to you but most doctors are not very well trained at first aid and as we all know first aid saves lives you know yourselves from the the uh, BLS uh, stuff that you teach in terms of cardiac arrest and last year um, I had the privilege of speaking here about uh, um, uh, why trauma patients die um, and I made reference to the experience I had and learnt all about from Iraq and Afghanistan where we have the most extraordinary survivors but those survivors wouldn't be alive to have an opportunity for all the surgery they need and their recovery if they didn't have appropriate immediate first aid when they were injured. Which is why the soldiers are taught self-help and buddy help. So if your leg's blown off and you're awake, you apply a tourniquet to your amputated, above your amputated limb. Um, if your mate is unconscious, you turn him into an appropriate uh, uh, three-quarter prone or unconscious position whatever terminology you use and that's what saved lives so yes the British military did extraordinarily well but they wouldn't have actually had viable patients had the first aid not be right so last year I talked particularly about airway obstruction and hemorrhage I want this year to give you a, a doctor's presentation this is a doctor's presentation um, but I want to talk about how the initial management of fractures has an impact later on and how you as first aiders may well indirectly affect whether someone uh, is alive or not uh, to survive their injury and I'll go into that in some more detail. If I'm using medical terminology that you don't understand, ask, ask me uh, what I, uh, to clarify what I'm saying. If you don't understand any of the points, just interrupt me. I don't mind being in interrupted by you folks. It's different if I was at home and it was my wife, but that's another story, okay? So I do hope she's not gonna watch this presentation in the future, uh, um, otherwise Christmas is gonna be not so good this year. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about fatal fractures. So if you look at the image over on that side, um, there that's a an x-ray taken of the skull so if you like it's just an x-ray machine here just stay there sir and whoosh, you take an x-ray from the side okay now the story of this particular x-ray and i hope you might see there is a big indentation here like so is that this is a chap uh, who he actually lived in Wolverhampton nothing against Wolverhampton but I'm every story I'm going to tell you today is a true story and he woke up in the morning and said to his wife go make the tea um, and um, I, I would imagine this wasn't the first time that they'd had a disagreement about who was going to make the tea or otherwise and he was quite uh, uh, insistent go make the tea dear or whatever um, but she, she refused to budge. So he went downstairs, came back up with a hammer, and as a hammer indentation in the, in the skull there. And as a consequence of this head injury, which rendered her unconscious, and the bra associated brain injury that she had, she died. But there's no doubt that the major contributory factor here was that she didn't have appropriate airway care very early on when she was rendered unconscious. And this guy clearly couldn't, didn't care a toss because he didn't have his cup of tea and blow was he going to do what the ambulance service said when he eventually got round to phone the ambulance. Let's look at the middle one uh, there. So that is a fractured femur, the biggest bone in your body, the bone that will bleed the most. And if it's an open fracture as well, then you can easily bleed to death through a fracture of the femoral shaft. And as you can see, the, the bone is, there's a segmental fracture, there's a segmental piece there. And that injury in isolation will easily bleed up to 30% of someone's circulation. 
and if it's an open fracture that could all be in the in draining out onto the roadside or into the room or whatever the case may be so you could bleed to death from that so what saves a life there is obviously control of hemorrhage by whatever means you are trained to do and keeping that that limb still um, and desirably some form of immobilization and how much you can do for that will depend on your training if you're a paramedic you'll be able to put an extra, having given the patient uh, pain relief and check for other priorities, you'll be able to put an appropriate splint on, on that leg to completely immobilize it. But as uh, a simple, simple first aid measures would involve just keeping that, that leg still and stopping hemorrhage. But that may well save a life. Now that is a, that is a, a relatively young uh, male uh, there um, and um, if that was a 75 year old person, the blood loss associated with that might well be sufficient to kill them. So, you know, the, the older you are, the less resilience you've got to injury and the more, more important it is to, to stop external bleeding um, as soon as possible. The picture on this side is a CT scan of the chest wall and you can see loads of ribs uh, there and the arrows are a bit of a clue um, which show a whole series of fractures here and uh, so this is someone who's had a chest injury how many of you have ever had a, a, a chest injury what is your striking memory of your chest injury uh, yeah <laughs> and 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 uh, and they were painful a bit Very yeah okay yeah. so we all are clear on that so you break your ribs, fair enough. Uh, first aid management, you're going to put them in whatever position is probably most comfortable for that patient. I actually am of an old school um, uh, who would actually say if I've broken my ribs, I'll put my hand on it and try and splint them a bit. But I know there's a lot of debate about whether that's a good thing or not. But when I've injured my ribs playing rugby, years and years ago, certainly helping to splint them to stop the ribs from moving, the broken ends moving, was very beneficial from a pain perspective. But if this was a, let's say this is a 65 uh, year old lady or, or whatever the case may be, and she has a fall at home, she catches her ribs on the, um, on the side of the bed or something like that, and it hurts. We know that, she's a sensible lady, she takes paracetamol, she rings her daughter and so on, who comes around. The problem with that sort of injury, and you guys will verify this, and mom as well here, is that it hurts to breathe. So if you can't breathe properly, then you struggle and you can't cough. Coughing is, is, is awful. Um, and if you can't cough, you can't clear the sputum uh, that we have in our chest. And if you can't clear the sputum, you get a chest infection. So our 65 year old lady, is at a high risk of getting a chest infection and dying as a consequence. So recognizing, you know, even in the simple injuries, you know, if you, if you had to go, you saw someone three or four days ago, they'd had what seemed like a fairly straightforward, simple injury to their chest. Uh, but now they're a bit short of breath and they can't cough, then that will be telling them to go and seek medical help, either at the GP, but that will be too late because you can't get in for three weeks. So let's go to A&E, um, but get appropriate management, management there. So in relation to fractures, people can die in three phases. So there's early, intermediate and, and late. So the early ones are really the same as what I spoke about la last year. If you have a fracture and you get an airway obstruction as a consequence, and I'll go through some of these uh, in the next few slides, then you will die. Equally, if you're bleeding to death or you've got a big bleed and you're quite elderly, that can be sufficient to, to contribute to, to immediate death. And then there's the intermediate one, and I'm just going to go back, I hope, to that fractured femur. Um, now, I don't know if you ever look at the joint on a Sunday, um, times when we could afford to buy a joint, of course, but on the bone that you, you saw, there, there's marrow in, in, in that bone, and that is fat. So in the marrow of this, this patient's femur is fat, and where the bone is broken, that fat leaks out. 
And around the femur, there's, there obviously there's a lot of muscle, and a lot of the blood vessels in the muscle are damaged, so that, that fat will get into the circulation. So everyone, everyone who fractures their femur, all of you lot, um, uh, would get an element of fat, if it was you, in your circulation. And for the most part, um, you, you, that won't trouble you too much. Okay? So fat embolism, as that word is I had on there, happens every time you get a, a, a significant fracture. Very rare in kids, not so common in the elderly, because the elderly, as you get older, part of the age changes, you lose the fat in your bone marrow. But for all of you sort of young and middle-ish middle people here, um, without exception, then you would get a, a fat embolism. So I've said it happens to everyone. But some people get what's called a fat embolism syndrome, and that's where they get big problems in their chest as a consequence, because the fat affects the chest. And uh, the fat can actually get through to the brain, and it, it will make you confused, and can make you unconscious, and can kill you. So what's he rabbiting on about this fat stuff? Let me try and put it into proportion for you now. Everyone gets a fat embolism problem when they break a big long bone, but only a few people will get the problems I've said with their breathing and, and, and with their brain. And I'll illustrate that in two ways. Um, so I had a, a, a guy come in to me years ago who had a fracture, an open fracture of his tibia and his fibula down here. And it was managed completely as normal, but he died as a consequence of fat embolism. And we puzzled hard about this. But eventually the police were able to tell us that this chap was nicking lead off a, a, off a church roof when he fell and broke his legs. And his mates took him home with his leg waving all over the place. And it wasn't immobilised. And as a consequence, with that leg moving, more fat is getting into the circulation. And there's a tip over point between having the fat in your circulation and it then causing you a problem. So the explanation was very clear uh, to, to us that he, you know, this was a 12 hour old injury. The tibia had not been immobilized and he just had so much fat in his body that he that, that caused this fat embolism <laughs> syndrome, as it's called and he subsequently died as a consequence. Um, in routine practice, so this Saturday you're delivering first aid at a rugby or football match, or there's a road traffic accident down the lane, or someone falls off their horse and they've got a fractured tibia, there is absolutely no doubt that early immobilization reduces this problem. Um, and if you have associated, associated other injuries, like chest injuries, then it may not be within your remit of what you can deliver, but the early administration of oxygen make, makes a difference. So the correction of hypoxia, lack of oxygen, the correction of hypovolemia, lack of blood volume, makes a big difference. So going back to this fat embolism syndrome, thing, I, I, I dealt with a, a vicar, a very articulate vicar, many years ago, who, who fractured his, uh, it was his tib and fib actually, um, he was a, a vicar that rode a motorbike um, and I had a very sensible conversation the day he came in and said tomorrow we'll take you to theatre, we've immobilised your leg, you seem okay, we'll, we, we'll take you to theatre tomorrow and we'll put a metal rod down your, your femur and that should be fine, you'll be in hospital about four or five days. So I went to see him the next morning as we did quite early in the morning, he's on the operating list uh, and I said, I can't remember his name, but let's call, him, let's call his surname Johnson. If anyone's called Johnson here, I apologise. It's not your great-grandfather. Um, but Reverend Johnson, how are you this morning? And he said, f*** off, I don't know you. And I thought, well, that is a bit strange from a vicar, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but, you know, he had the brain manifestations of fat embolism. The di as soon as he opened his mouth, the, the diagnosis was clear. He was confused. And that's because fat has come out of his tibia. It gone through his heart into his lungs without getting complicated you get shunts in the lungs which then puts the blood back through your heart that goes to your brain so as first aiders first thing is you've now heard of fat embolism but secondly that you know that you can impact on this 
by effectively immobilizing major long, bo long bone fractures, the tibia, the femur in particular. And then, of course, um, a late consequence that can uh, uh, potentially kill you is infection. Um, people have horrible injuries. Sometimes uh, they get infected. Some of our military colleagues um, have, um, uh, have awful wounds that still, from time to time, flare up with infection. So you can actually perhaps impact on, on that. If someone's got an awful contaminated wound, then um, just to remove the gross contamination. We don't encourage the ambulance service to do more than that nowadays. We used to encourage people to irrigate big wounds, but not anymore. That's all done in hospital. But if you're away on your, uh, your exotic once in a lifetime trip to somewhere very remote, and you look like that sort of person, sir, that might go on a nice exotic holiday over there, or you, ma'am, and you're in, in isolation, and someone's got a fractured tib and fib, and it's going to be hours before someone comes along, then just to simply wash that wound out will get rid of a lot of the uh, contamination. Um, this is a problem we are currently seeing in uh, Ukraine at the moment, that the time from injury to definitive care in the hospital, because of they can't use helicopters, etc., can be three to five days. So people are presenting with quite, quite infected wounds. So, you know, depending on your scenario and sequence, you can impact that as a first aider um, just by reducing any of the contamination. Right. Have I upset anyone yet? I apologize for swearing, um, as did that vicar when he knew what he'd done. But any, are we clear on where we are so far? Yep. So if you've got a normal open fracture, then you wouldn't recommend first aid doing anything other than just covering it and do a lot of washing out or anything if you just wait for an Let me, Can I out reverse that and ask you what do you tell your people to do? I tell them to immobilise it and uh, yeah, yeah. if there's catastrophic bleeding <coughs> still yeah. without a wise way yeah. for emergency services. Yeah. yeah, I think that's probably very reasonable. If you're in isolation there's going to be many hours, you can immobilise the leg and, and, and one could, could gently wash over any, any contamination. I'd fully support that. Equally I'm very conscious that the, the what a doctor might do is probably different to what a first aider might do. So we'll have a bit of controversy later when we perhaps talk about chest seals and things like that. But uh, I, I, I'm up for debate on that. But yeah, I mean, if you can minimise it, I mean, the, it, that fracture is going to go to, the patient with a fracture is going to go to hospital. I just envisage the femur going on its own then, just as I, <laughs> said, as I said it. But that patient with the fracture is going to uh, going to, uh, uh, to a hospital. In hospital, uh, they will keep it immobilised for the reasons we've already discussed about the risk of fat embolism and that reduces pain. And the patient will go to the operating theatre and they will wash that whole limb out and they'll pull the bone ends out of the skin because the patient's asleep um, and wash out all contamination. And you, you often use 10 litres of, of, of uh, salt, salt or water solution to do that. So I think it's first aiders. I mean, if someone's fallen over in a uh, in 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 the um, um, uh, where the horses live, stable in the stable. Thank you very much. In the stable or the cow shed, then and it's covered in tish. Then it would be very reasonable to to remove that to reduce the the contamination. All right, Thanks. brilliant. Good. Let's move on. So you need us. You need a system for managing all these patients, of course, and the one that we commonly use is CM for massive external hemorrhage, catastrophic hemorrhage. Any, anyone ever seen really catastrophic hemorrhage? Right, okay, so I don't know what your definition of catastrophic hemorrhage is, but I've seen quite a few of these. Catastrophic hemorrhage to me is, is hemorrhage you can hear believe it or not, because when you sever a big blood vessel, if you're there within seconds of it happening, you hear a whoosh, a whoosh, just like catastrophic hemorrhage. But big hemorrhage, you know, and, and that's why that must become before airway, because, you know, your patient may have a massive external hemorrhage and they may have an obstructed airway, but if you manage their airway, by the time you've managed their airway, they're dead because they've bled out from their massive external hemorrhage. Can I ask you where you saw this? Yeah, brilliant. I saw yeah. mine uh, a workplace accident where uh, someone was moving sheet metal. Yeah. And the sheet metal went through their arm and could not do it. Absolutely, no. 
I mean, they are relatively rare events, but, uh, you know, I, I had a meeting in London with the Met Police this week um, uh, because there is a lot of sensitivity, obviously, about stabbings and knife crime at the moment, and people are dying because they're stabbed and, and they bleed to death externally. So it's something that for us all to, to try to get, to get right. So massive external hemorrhage, airway, breathing, circulation, disability is about unconsciousness, and E exposure is the environment and so on. And I'm just gonna go through my, my normal paradigm there, but also go through some, uh, uh, some examples. Okay. Some of my photos I show you are, 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 um, are pretty awful to look at, but all that said, it could be you tomorrow that comes across this patient. So uh, uh, there we go. So there we are, massive external hemorrhage, okay? This is someone who sends me a Christmas card. Well, not the leg, but the patient sends me a Christmas card still, okay? This is a chap who, uh, when I first met him at the scene of his incident, was a student uh, studying law so, and he's still in the, the legal profession and he was also an epileptic and he had a fit and he fell on the railway line. Fortuitously, if you like, um, uh, it didn't take his life, it, it only traumatised his limb. But you can well imagine that is pretty challenging bleeding um, and the early application of a tourniquet uh, which you can't see there, would be life-saving. The patient over on the left-hand side, as you look, is extraordinarily lucky uh, to still uh, be, be alive, but has had catastrophic uh, bleeding. Um, and as you can see that from the, the environment that he's lying in. What you cannot see quite is that someone's applied a high tourniquet to this guy's leg because big amputations like that, lives are only saved by early application of tourniquets. We're all, of course, quite sensitive to, to uh, the Manchester Arena bombing, um, and there's no doubt, no doubt, that some lives could potentially have been saved by early application of tourniquets. So it's particularly relevant in, in bomb and blast injuries. So that's massive external hemorrhage. And you can all deal with that. You know, you all will be able to apply a tourniquet, be able to improvise. A you've all got a tourniquet with you now um, because you've got your shirt sleeve. Um, you've all got shirt sleeves we could use. Belt, yeah, something very narrow. I try, I mean, like a belt like mine, I would try to dissuade. They don't work so well. But you've all got sufficient kit with you on you at this moment in time to be able to improvise a, a tourniquet for massive external bleeding. And you'll be much better at controlling that bleeding than with respect the average other medical professional who at least you will have thought about it where many others won't have done. So let's about airway compromise, okay? Um, so the top patient here uh, fell, was, had a few beers, fell over, was unconscious, um, had an obstructive airway, uh, no one was there to manage this and died as a consequence. But he had a skull fracture. Okay? So I've looked at head injuries before with you and we've seen that before. The middle picture is a little difficult for you to recognise, but this, uh, what you can see, just up the top there is a moustache, upper lip moustache on a chap who's come off of his, out of his car and taken out a metal post and you can see uh, his teeth here um, and this is so this is a big wound just sort of where my hand is here they bleed a lot yep but the biggest issue here is obstructing your airway so if he lies on his back he will fill his airway with blood and he will die if you turn him over and you put him that uh, side of his face dependent then, then the blood will all drain away and he will survive, okay? This one's quite an interesting one, okay? You, you may, not, again, may not be quite easy to pick up, but uh, up. I'm just gonna move a little bit. Nose, mouth, 
but this is the windpipe down here. So this is the neck opened up. Okay, this is a post-mortem uh, examination, and that is this is where the uh, the larynx becomes the trachea going down into the chest. So this is a story of two well-to-do ladies out on their horses on a nice uh, morning. So they're going along like this, as you do on a horse. You can see I don't ride a horse, but we're riding a horse. And they are, te this again, terribly, terribly posh people. Um, some of you might know them, but they're very, very, very posh. And they're riding along. And this lady here was yapping away like this. And she didn't see the branch on the tree coming towards her. And she gets hit by the branch on the tree, knocks her to the ground. And that ruptures her, her larynx uh, uh, here. Um, and of course, it bleeds and it fills her airway and she dies. Now, tipping her into an airway a, a protected position may, may have helped that. But in fact, uh, you know, she could have been saved by a paramedic because they're authorised to make a little incision in the neck to try and give, to open an airway. But that is just an example where a fracture, in this case a laryn laryngeal tracheal fracture, has... Um, has led to death. The bottom one is difficult to to visualise, but uh, if I just if I just take this gentleman's head off, put it here a moment, and then I get my CT scanner and I scan him from above, then all I'm going to see is his ribs, and that's all you can see here. Looking down, are the patient's ribs coming round, the shoulder blades at the back. And what you see here are his collarbones. Now, his collarbone, that particular collarbone there, so as you're looking at it, it's the, left, it's the left one as you're looking, has been displaced back, and that's obstructing his airway. And that is a relatively common injury in rugby, kind of ironic, we're at a rugby club here, less frequently since the scrumming rules of change. But um, the... The, the collarbone is pushed back and it obstructs and presses on the, on the trachea um, and, it, and it causes uh, problems. So this guy <coughs> straight away on the pitch. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to demonstrate fractures and injuries that can, can lead to death, okay? All it actually needs is for someone to is actually, you can all feel your own collarbones here, can't you? Because they're all under the skin. You put a finger just behind the collarbone and you think, well, that feels a bit wonky. And you can flick it forward. And he goes from... <sighs> so, you, you know, that, they, they're rare injury, particularly now, but I'm just trying to demonstrate fatal fractures to you. So, cervical spine injuries, yes. Um, so spinal trauma can uh, be, a, be fatal, it can be immediately fatal. S someone explain to me how you breathe. How do you, how do you breathe? Who wants to tell me how, what you need to breathe? Go on, sir. Breathe in, breathe out and pause. Okay, breathe in and breathe out. What makes that happen? Uh, the diaphragm yep. contracts. Yeah, so your diaphragm, the muscle between the, the chest and the abdomen, your the diaphragm contracts. Oh, I like that. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, in the presence of a, of the right atmosphere, oxygen, with an open airway, and with a brain that's working, and it's my brain says, right, we're going to breathe, we're going to inspire, is the word, um, and it tells my diaphragm to move down. Now, my diaphragm is controlled by the cervical. That means the neck, three, four, and five. Uh, nerve roots. Um, so there's eight nerve roots uh, in the in the cervical spine. So these come out at, at mid, just up, just before midway, three, four, five down, and that tells my diaphragm to move down. And then lower down in the thoracic region, lower down in my spine, there are little uh, nerves that come out that tell each of my ribs and their muscles to contract, and that increases the dimensions of my chest. So. If I've got some oxygen, if I've got a brain that's working, if I've got a spinal cord um, and I've got an intact chest wall, nothing obstructing my airway, then what happens is my diaphragm goes down, my chest wall goes out and that generates a negative pressure. 
in the pr in, inside the pleural cavity, inside the chest cavity. And with an open airway, with negative pressure, air goes in and you breathe out, which is the reverse of that. So the muscles all contract and your diaphragm comes up. So I've said that the diaphragm uh, is, relies on what's called the phrenic nerve and that comes out in C3, 4, 5. So difficult to see from where you are but this is the vertebral column here and this is the vertebral column back there and that should be on top of that. So this is a high cervical, high neck injury at such a level that once that occurs, you can't breathe um, because you've lost all your muscles, to your nerves to your chest wall and you've lost your, your phrenic nerves so your diaphragm can't move. So uh, these are people who who are probably instantaneously killed in, in high energy trauma, road traffic collisions and so on. Uh, years ago in my pre-hospital care role with the team, uh, we went, I went to a little boy of, of seven uh, who was knocked over in the street. He was carried into the paper shop. We were literally round the corner. We were tasked straight away. We went to him. Um, at that time, he still had a pulse, but he wasn't breathing. We did all the necessary resuscitation. He went to a hospital. He woke up from this, but in fact could never move his arms or legs again because he had a complete uh, dislocation high in the spine here. Um, and uh, that was a problem. All that said, we now have diaphragm implants in terms of nerve stimulators for diaphragm. So things are getting very clever, even these injuries that, that used to kill you. And this is just an example of, a, of an injury a bit lower down this is a sort of classic falling down the stair or one of them falling down the stair injuries where um where you've lost part of the 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 diaphragm there because of the phrenic nerve and you might breathe okay to begin with but then you get you get tired after a while and exhausted um, but that's just to illustrate the cervical uh, injuries let's talk about chest injuries so massive external hemorrhage tick airway tick breathing breathing okay so the top one is an open chest injury. All right, that's a machete wound actually. Um, if you lifted it up and look in, you could see the lungs and you could see the heart, but let's not do that. But if you just push those big edges down together, then you close most of that, most, most of that off. So most open chest injuries you're gonna see are gonna be probably small. They're gonna be stab wounds. So how do you manage a, uh, an open chest wound? Let, let's, let's have a survey, okay? Let's supposing that the next patient you see has got a stab wound here, all right? And there's a bit of air, you can see there's some air going in and out of the chest. How many are just gonna do nothing and just leave it as it is? All right, thank you. Um, how many are gonna seal it completely? Mm -hmm. How many are going to put a chest seal on it? Okay, good. Now, how many of you have forgot your first aid kit and you don't have a chest seal? So what are you lot going to do without a chest seal? Sorry? You put a three-sided dressing on. Okay. So I'm delighted that there's a lot of controversy on this. Um, um, but to me, it's quite, quite, quite simple, really. If you've got a hole in your chest wall um, and that hole is bigger than a third of the diameter of your trachea. So there's my trachea, a third of that. If, if the hole in my chest is bigger than a third of that, air will go in and out of here rather than, than uh, the nor normal route. So it needs to be managed. If you leave it alone, and I know that's, that's a lot of conventional teaching, the rationale for the conventional teaching is as I'm stabbed, I'm contorting and when I move back, some of the muscles then cover the hole so it doesn't leak that much. There is, there is a rationale for that. If there's air obviously coming out, you could completely seal it. Um, now, if you completely seal it, that's fine because now the patient can generate that negative pressure in the chest, which we talked about earlier. It's great, but if he, he might just leak some air into the chest wall, in which case, over time, he'll get short of breath then all I do is unseal it and, and, and let the air out and reseal it and then the patient breathes again. 
or you could have a three-sided dressing and if it's a three-sided dressing then if the pressure inside builds up then that one side will raise and the air will come out. So how you manage this depends on your on who you are and your level of, of competence and I guess your confidence in this. Um, so I would, would pretty much seal it. Of course, if you've got a chest seal, you seal the wound completely so air can't go in, but it has the ability for that chest seal to let air out. So that has to be the, the gold ticket in this. So all of those are, are potentially uh, acceptable. So you need to ask, um, ask yourself how you might manage those, those scenarios. All right. Massive flail chest. Anyone describe to me what a flail chest is? Go on then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're absolutely right. So by asking a question, it means I needed a drink, you see, but I've done that. But you are spot on in your answer. So we know what makes you breathe. Your chest wall's got to go out and in, isn't it? Goes out, negative pressure, open airway, air goes in, great, relax afterwards. But if you fracture two or more ribs in two or more places, then when you generate that negative pressure, the chest goes in. It doesn't come out so, so that you, you don't breathe on that side. Does that make sense? Yeah? So normally your chest wall is great, your chest goes in and out, you generate that negative pressure, air goes in. On this side I've got loads of fractures, so when I generate that pressure, this moves in to negate that negative pressure so when I open my mouth and try to, to breathe I, I'll breathe on this side but there's no breathing on that side because of that pressure and this is a clever double exposure picture here that when this person this patient breathes in the chest wall moves out on the right side but on the left side where there's a flail then it, it, um, it indraws okay brilliant happy on that so if you break loads of ribs every time you break a rib each individual fracture bleeds about 150 milliliters of blood so if you bleed lots of break lots of ribs then you can have quite a lot of blood so all one sees here is a chest full of blood on that side and also there's a pneumothorax air in the in the chest as well so these are all potentially life-threatening uh, chest injuries a b c um, now this is a guy, this guy has got a splinter in his chest, as you might see that. Um, that is a, 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 a post, um, it's, he's rolled his car, as he's come out of the car, he's gone on the fence post and the fence post has, has gone through him. But how you would manage that would be CM, A, B, C, D, E, and get him to the hospital. The usual rule of thumb is if someone is alive at the scene with that sort of injury, then they ought to stay alive if they get to a hospital or the right hospital quickly enough for their surgery. So that's, uh, that's breathing. Any comments, questions, anyone wishing to throw anything, anything I've said that isn't agreeable or disagreeable? Well, that's a relief anyway, thank you. Right, C, circulation, AECM, massive external hemorrhage, airway breathing, circulation. Right, so the top picture is a, I mean the pelvis is like a big ring um, and it's disrupted here and pelvic fractures and it's disrupted at the back are all associated with lots of bleeding hence someone with a pelvic fracture should be kept still and when the ambulance service comes they'll have a splint applied if you're in the middle of Africa on your safari and it's a long wait then you could externally uh, put you know, take your coat or your shirt to immobilize the, the, the patient's pelvis um, Long bone fractures bleed a lot. I've already said how much they can bleed. Um, so you, you may not have massive external hemorrhage, but if you've broken more than one uh, uh, big bone, then you can become shocked. So Im early immobilization, early control of external bleeding is important. Um, and uh, uh, if I took a slicer and cut you in half this time and lift the top half away, um, you won't sit in the front again, will you? <laughs> and then I, I, I scan you from, uh, I take a scan, sorry, that way, um, then that is your liver over there, but this is your spleen, and that is a broken rib, so your broken ribs on that, 
left side, it is the left side, have ruptured your spleen. So what can a first aider do about a ruptured spleen? Lie the person down on the position most comfortable, elevate the legs, get them to hospital as quickly as possible. All right, I'm not advocating you opening the belly and taking the spleen out for obvious reasons. But recognising the potential for an <coughs> abdominal injury and why someone might be showing features of shock, getting them to hospital quickly is so important. Head injury, head injury, disability, all right? Um, so if you bang your head, you, your brain is like a blancmange inside and you will get, uh, or you can get some associated bleeding. So this sort of what's called lenticular bleeding there is called an extradural hematoma. Um, and that is beginning to push the brain over. So this is someone who says has been hit on the side of the head with a cricket ball, might, better, might been rendered unconscious, but then wakes up and then gets more and more drowsy and goes unconscious. They're going to need a surgeon to drill a hole in the head to rectify that. But that is potentially a fatal injury. The acute subdural, the, the, the dural bit are just spaces on the surface of the brain. So this subdural is more common in the older patient. As you get older, your brain does tend to shrink a bit and there's more room should you bang your head and you get bleeding. And, and something like 25% of all people over 65 are on blood thinners. And if you bang your head, you're more likely to get a bleed. So early recognition of what's going on is so important and getting them to a hospital. This is a child with a big brain injury, but they've got their brain injury in part due to the fact they didn't have uh, um, air, appropriate airway uh, management at the outset. Right, exposure, um, A, B, C, D, E, um, speaks for itself. Um, obviously, uh, if you get hypothermic, um, then the, and, and, and you stay out in the cold, then you obviously you may, and a lot of RTCs I've seen in the past, people have dri driven through a hedge in the middle of the night because they've had a few to, to drink and they're found the next morning and they're cold. And this sort of weather, if you're out on the streets last night and you're in that rain, then you could well become hypothermic, particularly, and if you're injured, that adds to the risks of, uh, of, of a poor output. Um, and of course, let's remember our elderly folk who, who are not as good at maintaining core body temperature um, and if they've been lying on the floor overnight may well be cold and that will just worsen their outcome. Um, I like to put this in so ABC and then DEFG means don't ever forget glucose and that's just to remind us to, to, to try to identify our diabetic patients who may have, have a low sugar, may have gone hypo as indeed what happened in this particular patient who then when they've gone hypo has fallen and um, got quite a nasty head injury so associated fractures with that. Now this is an interesting slide um, uh, uh, but I just want to try and explain to you how first aiders really can make a big difference, a truly big difference in someone who has really the most severe injuries that you could possibly, you might say, well, I, you know, I couldn't take the spleen out, I couldn't drain what was gone in the head, but you've got the gift of, of maintaining an airway and a gift of, of controlling external hemorrhage. So let me try and explain, explain this to you, okay. The picture on the top left over there, on there, is the, the circulation in the earlobe of a rat, okay. This is part of the work that I was indirectly involved with at Porton Down years ago. So that's the circulation in a rat. So whatever you tell anyone of what you've been listening to today when you go home, you can say we were talking about circulation in a rat's ear, which is absolutely true. But this rat has had an injection in its tummy of a chemical. So it's the rat has now has peritonitis, that's what you used to get you know, when you had an awful appendicitis years ago or the risk of infection and inflammation in the tummy. And this picture on the right is taken 20 minutes after the picture on the left. And we'll all agree that, you, that the rat's earlobe is a long way away from its tummy. So this rat hasn't injured its earlobe at all. It's got 
what's called a systemic capillary leak. That just means its small blood vessels are leaking. And that is in response to this insult, the fact someone's injected his tummy to, with, with a chemical. Now let's go to the, an 18 year old out on his motorbike who, um, who has an accident. Before he has his accident, if you were to look at the circulation in his earlobe, you'd have to take his, <laughs> you'd have, probably have to take his helmet off, but never mind. Um, you, that's what his circulation would look like. But, you know, 20 minutes later, if he's got big injuries, his circulation is going to look like that. So what I'm saying is that everyone with big injuries get this tendency to be leaky, their circulation to be leaky. And that contributes to a poor outcome. So of all the patients that come into, I work at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, um, of all our major trauma patients that come in, a third of these patients have got earlobes that would look like that. They're already leaky because that is part of the body's response to trauma. And basically there's a war that goes on up here is, is every time you do something to that patient, they tend to be more leaky and then there's a tendency to be less leaky and you really want to end up on this middle line here. But you as first aiders can impact on how severe this leakiness is. If you split near fractures, if you reduce the amount of external blood loss, if you try and optimise their airway by whatever you can do to keeping an open airway, if oxygen administration is available to you by giving oxygen. So even in these really critical situations, our first aiders can make a very positive contribution to risk, reducing the risk of injury. I'm going back to fat embolism now, okay, um, uh, in the intermediate group. So a normal chest x-ray looks really pretty clear. But what you see over here is that uh, this is what's described as a ground glass appearance. You can see the ribs, you can see the heart, there's the diaphragm. Um, but this should, these lungs should be pretty clear, but they're not. So that's fat embolism. So someone has a fracture, the fracture isn't properly immobilized. They may have got a bit shocked. They may have got a bit lack of oxygen hypoxic and they then uh, get fat embolism. And the white bits you see here are flat glo fat globules in the back of the eye. So uh, associated with a compromise to the brain. This could well have been my vicar's eyes, uh, um, as it were. Infection, so yes, infection. Remember the lady with a chest injury, if we can encourage her to breathe, get her to medical help, get some good pain relief. She may not get a pneumonia, which is shown up over there. Or if someone has some pretty awful limb injuries, then early appropriate management of that, perhaps removing that gross contamination may well make a difference. So there's some more causes here. Let's look at blood clots. So uh, less people die of blood clots following injury now than they used to. And that's because when you're in hospital now, if you had a big injury, then you, you're, you're given uh, blood thinning injections as a matter of routine. But just think that all of those causes down there um, are, are put you at an increased risk of uh, getting a blood clot and a blood clot that goes from your legs or your pelvis to your lungs which comprom compromises your ability to breathe and may well kill you. So immobility, obesity, that patient has an accident then there's a big risk that they're going to get a blood clot um, and uh, um, what's called a thromboembolism. So I'm just trying to show where if you have fractures and injuries and associated with these other factors here increases your risk of having a blood clot and a potential poor outcome. Now if I were to stand on a chair, I'm not going to ask you to, but you to lie down on the, on the floor and I took from a great height and landed on your, on your leg um, and broke your leg, it would hurt, yep. There would be some bleeding, yep. Uh, it would swell, yep, but it's a closed injury. So it's a closed injury, there's no external wound to it. And if you imagine my arm, the, the, my, my shirt here is, is, is the skin. If my arm swells inside, then sooner or later my shirt's going to get very tight, yep. So 
What can happen around your muscles in your leg is that if you get that injury, I've just inflicted on that nice man over there. Um, I, I've broken his leg so he can't chase me, but if that did happen to him, then what happens is this swelling goes on in the leg and over time you get a compartment syndrome because the pressure is so great because of that swelling that the blood can't now get into the leg. So your, blood, your, your leg hasn't got a, a blood supply or, or it's very reduced. And the classical features are pain, the leg looks white, it get, feels numb, which is paresthesia, and you can't feel any pulses. And that's called a compartment syndrome. That's just because a lot of bleeding and swelling has occurred in a closed space and it needs a surgeon to release that. Now that takes about four hours to, to occur. So in normal first aid, if you're a cord and you're there, you're probably not gonna see it. But if, if, you know, if, you, if you find someone who fell off a roof yesterday and they've broken their tip and fib and they're in so much pain, they could well have a compartment syndrome. So that needs as a, an emergency for surgeons. Um, the elderly, of course, um, or the older people in this, they're frail, they, they don't tolerate um, uh, shock very well or, or chest injuries. They've often got other problems with, uh, as well, so they might have heart disease or had a stroke or be diabetic, and they may be on drugs. So all of these may impact on whether someone survives or otherwise from a fracture. And our elderly, um, you know, if you fracture your neck of femur and you're elderly, then 10% of those patients will die in hospital as a consequence, and 30% are actually dead at, at a year because these bones, these, these are people who are quite frail to begin with and our elderly folks won't tolerate chest injuries. That mark on the chest there is around a whole load of rib fractures. So just highlighting fatal fractures, if you like, the complications is of fractures. Sorry, that could also happen with thinking about like SIA, bad shoulders, dormant, if someone's out drinking <coughs> drugs, are they then, if they ended up with a break, is, are they sort of falling into that similar category? What, a compartment syndrome or what? Uh, for the way you said the elderly, where they're yeah. on drugs and they are more... Okay, yeah, so you know, a good point. Let's stick on the drugs bit. So there is, a, if you're on certain drugs, there's a greater risk of getting um, associated problems that we've been discussing with it. You're quite right. Um, and, and actually, in, with some drugs, you can get compartment syndromes without actually being injured. It's just a consequence of the drugs. So good, good, good comment. Yeah, thank you. So if you've had an infection going on, we don't see too much of this now because we're quite good at managing this, but, but you, you, if you've got an ulcer like this that's been going on for decades, then it, firstly, the, it can become a malignant problem in the skin edge and you may die as a consequence. And there's a condition called amyloid disease where as a consequence of chronic infection in bones, you develop a problem that gives you kidney failure. So late infection, I'm being comprehensive. Many of these things you won't have heard of. And whilst thus far I've really talked about the physical complications, let's not forget the, the mental health issues as well. Um, so um, people who've had um, big injuries, uh, with, you know, talk about our military population, lots of injuries, mental health issues, often the marital home breaks up, uh, there is a, a alcohol and, and drug abuse associated with this, but that could happen, you know, not just to the miniature, anyone else, but a, a, a post-injury, that there is a, a, a big mental health uh, issue uh, with this. Um, so, in summary, um, then, it's CMABCD, massive hemorrhage every time, and just remember that um, some fractures can be fatal both early, intermediate and late. But the very important takeaway message, the very important takeaway message is that you as first aiders or as trainers and first aiders can impact on so many of these problems. And it's a lack of appropriate <coughs> early first aid which, uh, which contributes either to a death because things are not done or can um, uh, add to complications. So never feel, never be undervalued by what you're achieving. Indirectly, for so many patients, you're improving the outcomes, even with some very big injuries. Thank you, Keith, sorry.